it is my pleasure and opportunity, to, a delighted opportunity to introduce as our speaker today, State Representative Patrick Penn. Good afternoon, how's everyone doing? All right. Uh, thank you all so very much for having me come out tonight, uh, today rather, and, and speak uh, very briefly on some of the things that we saw happen in the most recent midterm election and some of the ways that we can move forward. Uh, I will let you know that I am, thank you uh, for the very, very gracious introduction there, Carl. Uh, I'm very humbled to serve you in all of those capacities and it's, it's not a small thing, uh, both for my family to serve uh, because we come from a family of servants. Uh, my wife uh, served for over 11 years in the Air Force herself. Uh, I know that we have a few Air Force members in here, show of hands. Okay, thank you guys for your service. Go Army, beat Air Force. Didn't happen this year, maybe next year. And uh, do we have any Naval uh, veterans in here right now? Anybody ever serve in the Navy? Okay, we got the cameraman. Go Army, beat Navy. We're going to make this happen. All right. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, have this conversation, a fireside chat, if you will, with uh, the President and discuss a few of the things that we see for the GOP as far as minority outreach going into the minority communities looking forward, uh, but also just to understand a little bit more of what that actually shapes up and looks like. So I would love to have your input. Uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A once we have a, a little bit of a chance to speak. And do we have that microphone situation squared away? It will hopefully be here shortly. All right, we're old army now. We're going to project. Let us know if you can't uh, hear us with a show of hands, and, and uh, we'll get this show on the road, okay? Thank you all so very much. We appreciate all your help. Patrick and I were talking about how we would proceed with the presentation today, and he expressed an interest in following the idea of a uh, dialogue with the traveling mic, not only to give you all an opportunity to ask questions, but also to raise issues tied into the good and the bad from the last election in terms of how we managed. The Republicans nationally received several million more votes in their candidates for the House of Representatives than the Democrats did. Unfortunately, that didn't translate into a number of new additional seats, only eight seats switched over. It's kind of a mere reverse of the last United States House on membership. And from the discussion I was talking with Patrick, we were interested in terms of why we were able to get those increased numbers, but it didn't show up in terms of election victories in those important House races. And of course, even worse, it didn't show up in the Senate races where we had a net loss of one. And what I was hoping to have was a little back and forth between Patrick and myself with the traveling mic, which should be here shortly. Um, but, and I appreciate all your, all your patience in terms of how we're handling it. But one of the important understandings that we have is what worked out right where we won some that were really, really close. I mean, here in Kansas, we had some significant victories. Lynn Rogers will no longer be state treasurer. Um, and, and Steve Johnson will be able to lead forward in terms of defeating ESG. And th he won by a pretty, Steve won by a pretty handy margin, over 100,000 votes. But Chris Kobach, while he did win, his margin was actually smaller than uh, Kelly's victory over Derek Schmidt. And all those, those two races, AG and governor, incredibly close. And what could we have done differently to move the ball and what mistakes that occurred? And looking forward, um, we've got to get around the media problem because I don't know if, if you saw, if anybody saw this today. Uh, did anybody happen to see Diane's comments in today's paper? Um, the odious and despicable, and those of you who were here when Diane, last time he attended a Pachyderm Club meeting, and I was publicly chastising him for his comments from the Pachyderm podium, I didn't realize that he was going to compound this. There was a very outrageous, apparently, based on news reports, events at a high school basketball game between Valley Center 
and one of the Topeka high schools in Topeka. And the press reports are a little bit garbled because they weren't explicit in terms of what apparently was said, and there's some controversy in terms of what it was. But the bottom line was there's evidence, significant evidence, of some racial epithets being thrown at that basketball game. And in today's paper, Diane Leffler said, the Republicans are racist because this event occurred and we aren't on board with the politically correct, woke, CRT ideology that was trying to be crammed down our throats. Now, going forward, elected officials here today have to take, have to take this into their hands and the challenge for legislators is in terms of where we go, in terms of is there statutory changes with ESG that are needed? That's one issue, but more importantly for where we are in terms of outreach to minority voters broadly defined, and I'm not just referring to African Americans here, but going forward to all voters that, you know, we, the Republican Party stands for judging people on the content of their character, not on any other criteria, their color of their skin, their race, their religion, their national origin. Everybody's free to pursue the American dream. And we're looking for Patrick to, to, to give us some insight in terms of what we did, what did we do right, and what could we have done better. And I'm going to turn the microphone back over to him to let him do so, and I'm going to see if I can wrestle away the traveling <laughs> mic from the other room. Patrick, you're on. Okay. That's a tall order. Some of the things that we uh, saw happen in the last election, uh, we saw growth uh, in the Johnson County area of the Democrat vote. Uh, many folks would say that that was more or less a blowout. Now, I'll tell you from personal experience, I'm a member of uh, the board member of the RHCC, that's called the Republican House Campaign Committee. So one of the things that we actually do is we raise funds and we had an opportunity to um, be blessed to raise over a million dollars, uh, far outstripping any of the other fundraising records that we had previously, uh, in order to send those monies to different campaigns and make sure that we get uh, good conservatives, uh, but Republicans all, elected into these House seats. Uh, and that's just from the House side of the, of, of the equation. Where we could not spend money and direct money into those races, a number of us were deployed to provide physical presence, to knock doors, to go and engage voters. And that was something that was very, very important to me to go and do. So I deployed um, to Topeka, um, Leavenworth, Johnson County, all environment around there, as well as uh, down south a little bit of, into Derby as well. Uh, to help out a number of different candidates. And some of the things that we saw, even not just as uh, what we saw here in Wichita in some of those environments, but definitely in the Johnson County area. Anybody, show of hands, know of uh, an individual by the name of Valdinia Wynn? Okay, I got a couple of hands. A couple of people know that. Okay, um, and don't show thumbs downs or anything like that. Valdania Wynn has been sitting in that seat for over 20 years. There was some scuttlebutt about whether or not she actually lives in the district that she represents, which would be disqualifying in and of itself. I deployed forward to go and knock doors for a gentleman by the name of Pepe Cabrera. And like myself, he's a veteran. And like myself, he was a signalier captain. Uh, and we have this saying, you can talk about us, but you can't talk without us. And Pepe ran an indomitable campaign. Uh, you all remember the, the little movie, uh, what is it called, um, Napoleon Dynamite? And he had the little friend and he had the little t-shirt, vote for Pepe, they were running for school. I wore, I wore that shirt all over, it was great. And here's what I will tell you, what we saw happen on that ground was that there were a number of individuals in those environments who did not know that Valdinia Wynn was their state representative. That was something that we could have used to our advantage. Because as we knocked those doors, we found not only did they not know who their representative, uh, who the representatives were, they were also very much dismayed, disappointed, and disgusted with all of the malfeasance, degradation, and dilapidation that their representatives have been delivering in Valdinia Wynn's case for over 20 years. Now to have that type of name ID 
would be one thing that would blanch uh, us uh, to say, hey, we're not going to run against that person because that's a Democrat district by the numbers and it's high name ID and it's just not worth it. But when you have that type of name ID coupled with what type of results, there is, therein lies an opportunity. She did not circulate in the community at all. They did not know her besides just seeing the name on the ballot. And we had a prime opportunity to flip one of those seats for the House. Saw the exact same thing happen in a district nearby. There's a gentleman by the name of Broderick Henderson uh, who had been in the State House for quite a while, yet another minority uh, member, another uh, Democrat. And that district knew him by name as well. But he retired. And when he retired, he put up to backfill him, his nephew, okay? Now, I don't know about y'all, but in Kansas, people don't like dynasties, uh, from what I hear. And we went knocking doors in, in Broderick Henderson's district as well. And while people, just like with the Valdinia Wind piece, while they knew the name and they knew the name ID, they were not satisfied, they were not impressed, and they were not pleased with the results that these people had been delivering. Th and now, in that situation, you didn't have the incumbent running again. What you had was a newcomer, with no name ID, the nephew, and a Republican who was running as well by the name of Sam Stilwell. And if we'd gotten behind Sam Stilwell, I, I feel that that type of same momentum that we would have seen over in the, uh, in the Wynn district would have actually played out as well. Uh, we could have flipped two seats in the Kansas City, Kansas area. We saw down here in Wichita, uh, What's his name? Uh, Rick, uh, losing the last name. Rick Lindsay. Yeah, there we are. And no, Rick, I'm not messing up your name because you're Navy. <laughs> but Rick Lindsay, uh, just an outstanding gentleman and an outstanding candidate. I went and knocked doors with him with uh, Kim Gish, as a matter of fact. And uh, we saw some of the same situations. We got in so many yard signs off the cuff. And he was such a great candidate, meeting the voters at the doors, engaging them and looking them eye to eye and letting them know that this is what he intends to do, this is who he is, and that they could trust him. And he got such positive response that we had one Hispanic voter, gentleman, uh, we walked up to the house, uh, and the gentleman at the door didn't speak a lick of English. Not a lick. But what he did was he, you know, by hand motions and just the, 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 the broken Span Spanish that I could speak, <laughs> he directed us to every single house to get a vote and get in a yard sign up and down his street. They were so intent on having opportunity, on having economic freedom, on having a choice of education, on having the, the, the chance to get employment, that these people saw exactly what Republicans and conservative principles are and they wanted it. The question that I have is, do we want them? So you can't go and say that you want to rent the vote every two years right in front of an election. We have to do the hard work to own the vote, and that takes some time. And that said, I see that we have a mic over here, so I'm gonna jump down. Well, let me ask you, stay, stay yes, sir. there at the mic, or I'll we okay. can pass the mic back. Turn yours on. Can oh. you guys all hear? <laughs> okay, I'll try. Is this better? Yes. I mean, it's back. Okay, got to keep it close. You mentioned three E's. I'd say when you're talking about earn, I view it as earn the vote. Would you talk about the three E's that yeah. I heard you mention yeah. and, and, and as a focus going forward to be stronger in 2024? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. When we look at it uh, as a military man, I think about things in terms of strategy, the overarching strategy, and then the next layer is how do you operationalize it? How do you actually uh, message it and get it forward in the next layer of, of influencers? And then the last piece is the tactical level. What tactics do you actually take to actually do the work and produce those results that you want to produce across the board? And when you're talking about, Carl, are, is the strategic level, the three E's. Now, I would, I would wager that, and I see my man, uh, Ed with the MAGA hat, President Trump was an amazing, amazing president. And one of the things that he did was he came up with the plan uh, for black America. And I know that we're not just talking about black America, we're talking about all Americans, but this is the, the, the example that I want to use. When you have a strategy and you press that out, and you display it in such a fashion that people can get behind it, it means the world. It means the world. 
I will tell you that in the black community, one of the biggest pieces of currency, if you will, is respect. That's the, anybody ever read the book, The Love Languages? That's the love language, okay? You see this in time immemorial. If you don't respect someone enough to see them as a man or a woman, to, show, to say that they have value, uh, I think that you miss that messaging piece. Trump did that. And that's why Trump had these margins of you know, double digits and won, but we're gonna get to some of that. Why is that important? Because when Trump came up with the uh, plan for black America, uh, with economic opportunity zones, by fully funding HBCUs, historically black colleges and historically black uh, universities. When he came up with these plans to you know, be pro-life and make sure that there was religious liberty, in the black community, one of the big businesses that we have is the church, the black church. It's, it's huge. It's generationally handed down. So when you actually say that I see you, I recognize you, and I want to make sure that you can succeed, uh, that means a lot to the hearts and the minds of those people in that community. I think that's something that we should be doing here in Kansas as well. When you look at it, those three E's that he's talking about on the strategic level, it is educational choice and freedom. I see we have some school board members in here. It is employment opportunity because we need more jobs. We need lower taxes and more taxpayers with lower taxes spread out across the board and it's economic development, as we discussed before, that opportunity to generate, create small businesses uh, to, to pursue the American dream, that is huge and is tantamount to being considered uh, a full and equal partner in the society. So if you look at those three E's, educational choice and freedom, employment opportunity, and economic development, those are the things that would benefit all Kansans of all colors and all stripes, but for the minority communities, it has an outsized benefit. So if we pursue in the legislature, I see a few of my colleagues here, if we pursue bills that actually achieve those types of end results, then we can have results and not rhetoric. Then you can get back into those communities and you can say, look, I see you, I recognize you, and I want what's best for you. And these are the principles that I have, and these are the results that I produce. And now you have that integrity. Now you have that stature to go in and make changes. And what results from that is political capital, political gains, political wins. Let me have, let me have you build, because the left is pushing, and the newspaper editorial today fits into it. They're mm -hmm. saying, We've got to move in the direction of more CIE and what I like to call diversity, inclusion, and equity, where we have equal outcomes, not equality. Very different. How do we communicate uh, against that woke tide that is being pushed by the cultural aspect of uh, and coming into the political world? Ah, that's, a, that's a great question. So his question is pertaining to DEI or DIE. I don't know how I want to <laughs> actually pursue that one. It goes both ways. Diversity. I did DIE. DIE. <laughs> because language comes before. It's, it's, uh, okay. Work. Yes, sir. Diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity, uh, and CRT, critical race theory, and those types of things. Uh, John, I, I, mean, I, I, would, I would tell you, Carl, that you know we have... I gave you a presentation on where I think uh, CRT is, uh, and I have a bill for that. Uh, we are actually sending that back through the process right now to make sure that it's in alignment with some of the things that we see nationally as well. So uh, given an opportunity, I'd love to come back and share that with you at a later time uh, if we get some motion on it. Well, let me the newspaper talking about DEI. Yeah, they call it DEI. But we're in an Orwellian world uh -huh. where the language is controlling where we go forward. And I firmly believe that we've got to make words that work, and to quote Frank once, mm -hmm. it was an interesting book he has by that title, mm -hmm. to communicate to the average voter and the average American what is going on going forward. And to expand this dialogue, go ahead. what I'm going to do is open this up for questions. Yeah, please do. Do you all have questions? I'm going to turn the mic over to Aaron, and he will get around and Let's continue the discussion. That's great. Oh, you don't have to stand, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, you talk to Democrats, and they don't have 
black Democrats. They don't have Hispanic Democrats or Asian Democrats or gay Democrats. But the Republicans have black Republicans and Hispanic Republicans and gay Republicans. Now the point I am making is what's the difference? Why do we have to segregate different groups? And the Dems don't have to do that. And another point is, you know, there's a lot of reverse discrimination. There's a lot of universities that have dorms just for blacks. That's just, and they don't allow whites in. I, I would like to see that we are all Republicans and not segregate ourselves. Uh, another thing is, black Republicans, I cannot join your group because I'm white. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. But, but, but the, my point is, I don't, I don't see the benefit of having these groups at all. Okay. Thank you for that, sir. Yes, please. Real quick, uh, thank you very much for your speech today. And, uh, uh, my, my question uh, succinctly is, um, I feel like there, there's a lot of chicanery that's been going on with elections, you know, uh, nationally, regionally, locally. Uh, do you have uh, any information? Do you have, uh, what's your feeling on the uh, Dropbox voting? And has that had a material, a significant effect here in the state of Kansas? I personally have, don't have information, and thank you for the question, but I personally don't have information on uh, if there's been any shenanigans going on in the state of Kansas as far as our election system. What I would be cautious to advise is before we go down the rail too far on saying that our election systems are un insecure or that we have a faulty election system, let's think about what that is actually going to do. That undermines the people's uh, confidence in, in, in the integrity of the election system. Thereby, no matter who wins or who loses, there will always be a call, a call or clamoring of fraud or uh, that something is improper or an impropriety. Um, I think that from what I can understand, and colleagues, y'all let me know if I'm wrong on this, and I know we have our elections chair as well, that we passed a law saying that there was, should be um, uh, 10, I believe it is, is the number of drop boxes that, that we would, uh, or the number of packets that uh, someone could come in and take if they were doing the um, harvesting, the ballot harvesting, I'm sorry, and that we concerned ourselves with where would those drop boxes that you're discussing, where would they be located, and how would they be observed as well. Uh, trying to put as much integrity in the system as possible is something that we were concerned with. There's a balance that goes on in the state house. Uh, whereas the majority of us would feel that it should be on election day at the ballot box, kind of how I supervised elections over in Iraq and Afghanistan, where people were dipping their finger in and showing you their finger that it was literally them that who voted. I'm comfortable with that. One person, one vote on election day, not election month at the, at the polling site. There are other individuals uh, who feel a little differently uh, for whatever the reason. They want a little bit more access and they want to blow that out a little bit more. Uh, so trying to strike that balance between overboard, where you, the further you get away from the ballot box on election day, you open and expose yourself to those shenanigans that you're talking about. Uh, how, do you, how do you find that, 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 that balance? And I think that's where we are right now. And uh, I'm looking forward to this next session because, as I said, we raised over a million dollars. We were able to maintain our supermajority with 85 members. So that maintained what our committee assignments look like as well, the number of members that we have on the committees. So if we choose to end those 85 members uh, with our, our retirements and our resignations and things of that nature, some of the people who came into the House, it trends a little bit more conservative as well on balance is, is my understanding. So we may have more of an appetite to do a little bit more tweaking on those election laws. So please stay engaged in the process. Come to events like this. Engage us and talk to us. Call us, email us, and let us know what your heart is because that gives us, uh, I don't want to say the spine, I want to say the top cover, right? 
and the direction because you're our bosses and when we hear from you that lets us know exactly what we're supposed to pursue to craft bills and legislation and vote for those bills and legislation so it's very important uh, if you have a concern with that number one substantiate it because every we got to stand on not conjecture but substantiation but number two communicate it effectively so we, that we can do the work for you properly yes sir we have a I'm sorry, what was the question? You're saying, should we get... Should we have an Asian Republican group? If, if there are Republicans of any stripe who feel that they would like to have a group go into Ed's uh, determination as well, if they feel like they want to coalesce uh, and, and, and uh, bring themselves together, I don't have a problem with freedom of assembly that's enshrined in the Constitution. Sir. Yeah, Patrick, uh, one of the things that, you know, when we're talking about getting people elected, yep. it's a marketing march that you have to go on. So one of the reasons to have these different caucuses by the way, the Indians do not have a <laughs> So, but uh, I think you have to fall back to a certain extent, you know, on the Republican, Kansas Republican platform. But remember, this is a marketing approach. And so if we have a Hispanic caucus, which I believe is a very, could be a very strong caucus, then we have to figure out how do we gain respect from the Hispanics? How do we gain respect from the blacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Okay? So these caucuses are not separate or apart. They are part of the strategy, the marketing strategy to get people elected. That's what I think. I, I would tend to agree with you on that, and thank you for that comment. Uh, when you see how, let's, 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 let's talk brass tacks. Political power is a function of two things, in my estimation. Number one, Power is access and influence. I'll say that again. Power is access and influence. You look at any of the groups that you have, and as you, as you discussed right there, Mr. Hollis, that it's a marketing piece. How do you market to a demographic so that you influence them or help them gain access? If they self identify and, and this is one of the things that I always say, even with the black community, they've been so conditioned over time to see themselves as a victim group because the left has done a number on us knee high to an ant all the way through college about intersectionality uh, you know uh, demographic representation those types of things so that you see yourself through that lens only the republicans challenge is not to disband that disavow that or destroy that it is to leverage that the question is, how do you leverage it for our purposes? You're not going to convince them in, a, in an election cycle in the next two years that they are not a, a victim or whatever the case is. What I always say is they are not a victim of some white guy wearing a you know top hat and a, and a monocle off of Monopoly. What they are is a victim indeed, but they have misplaced who the victimizer is. The victimizer is the Democrat Party and woke politics. When you're always telling people that they must drink sand, it is up to the Republican Party to offer the people true water. And that water comes in the form of what we call our lift principles, right? That true water is what we just discussed with the three E's. Everyone should be able to see themselves through the lens, not of wokeism and intersectionality and CRT and you're forever going to be a victim or a victimizer that you can't get right no matter how hard you try that you will not have any power because you will not have access and you will not have influence we have to understand how to build that and one of the ways that the minority communities can build that and we know in politics there are only two things that's the love language of politics right votes and dollars i'm gonna say that again love language of politics votes and dollars if you don't amass votes out of the black community, the Hispanic community, the Asian community, the, the white community, whoever it is, well, you're not going to have that prime politician come down and spend time with you. And if you can't finance the dream and deliver dollars to fund 
that operation that you're marketing for, what's the use? So what we have to concern ourselves with is how do we amass and build that power, right, for those communities by increasing their access and their influence. And the influence comes in, as I just discussed, through dollars and votes. So if you can do that um, and, and help us out with that, I'm all aboard. Sir. I think you should be on the committee for the military, state legislator. What is the process of getting you that seat on their PAC committee? I, uh, I'm going <laughs> to, I was about to defer over to uh, Representative Berquist on that for a little. He, he, they say there's a chair position for a reason, chair chooses. There you are. <laughs> Okay, so uh, our, our speaker-elect, Mr. Dan Hawkins, representative out of the 100, 100th district, correct, uh, just released his list of who the chairs and vice chairs are, but we have not filled out who's actually on the committees yet. So I would say that it would be a conversation uh, between the speaker-elect and whoever he's designated, as uh, Representative Burke was said, for that chair. That chair gets to have some influence on who is selected for their committee as well. Sir. I, I miss I miss both. The, <coughs> the speaker of the house has the ultimate say. Absolutely. Yeah, they may influence it, but the speaker of the house has the ultimate. Yes, sir. Which is why I said the speaker elect and his chair has some influence, those are my words. Because one of the things that we tongue in cheek say is that the speaker in, in the Kansas way of doing business is what we call a benevolent dictator. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of power there. Uh, but I am very, very pleased and honored to be a part of the team uh, and serve the people of Kansas in whatever capacity that uh, you know they see fit. Uh, because we're gonna work hard and we're gonna do a, j a good job no matter which committee we're on. Uh, and even if we aren't necessarily selected or seated on a committee, we all have an equal vote on that floor. So if there's ever an issue that you might have, access us. And uh, even if I'm not on that committee, I can go and talk to my colleagues and help get something that you might see before their eyes. Do you have another question in the back? Patrick, thank you for uh it's good to see you, Mark. And thank you for all your involvement for the last couple of years. You really made a difference, and I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. We have a Secretary of State that blatantly violated the law that you and the legislature passed last year. What are we going to do about that? I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I'm, I'm not familiar. Please help me. Okay. Uh, he, you guys, you, you started to mention it earlier. You said that... Um, you were going to have a requirement for people that were using the ballot drop boxes that they would have to be known and they would be limited to dropping 10 ballots per drop box. Your Secretary of State just thumbed his nose at you and, and, and wrote a uh, guidance for all of his uh, county clerks to put as many names as they want in the drop box as long as they use a different name every time for themselves and nobody's going to check them. They can put in the in, in the form for who's dropping them in the ballot drop box. They can use fictitious names. And as long as they didn't put any more than 10, for example, under the name of Mickey Mouse, mm -hmm. and 10 under the name of Donald Duck, and so on and so on, they had an unlimited number of ballots to drop in the drop box. He just thumbed his nose at you, and I tried to make the point during the primary and again during the general. And I want to know what is the, the legislature going to do about that, that he just thumbed his nose at the law that you passed and that the governor signed. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. I'm, I'm not familiar with those uh, this set of facts, but I will tell you this. If you will give me until perhaps uh, the, the end of January, uh, once we get back up there, I, and I'm saying this publicly to you, Mark, give me until the end of January to confer and find out exactly what's going on with that. Uh, and I'll find out what the process is, what the facts are, and get back to you on that, okay? That, that's uh, no later than January 31st, okay? They're taping it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Penn, I got two questions. One question is about marijuana, 
I think it's illegal to have it in the in Wichita, but it's illegal in the state of Kansas. Am I right? And uh, what's your opinion about that? Uh, I'm against the legalization of marijuana. Uh, my district does not vote for that. Marijuana is a Schedule One narcotic with the federal government, uh, and it is illegal in the state of Kansas to traffic it, uh, to use it without a doctor's note. Uh, as I sat on Fed and State Affairs last session, uh, that bill came before us and we crafted it out. It was ostensibly said that it was going to be a medical marijuana um, bill. That's not what actually came out. It was more of a tee up for recreational, like we see. Uh, across state lines and I understand the pressures that are there uh, just in my heart of hearts I don't see there's a need for us to do a gateway access into harder drugs for our youth um, a lot of the things that we have not heard from those other states that nearby who have legalized it uh, and this is where I am right now and I'm telling I'm being open kimono with you uh, I've not heard of all the horror stories that come out of that so I want the full scope and the full Monty tell me the good and the bad and respect me enough to allow me to give due consideration to all aspects of it. Uh, where we have right now a mayor, now what's his name, Mayor Wimple? That guy? Yeah. Mayor Wimple? Mayor Wimple. Yeah, Mayor Wimple decided to do something crazy with marijuana, um, but I, I don't think it has a whole bunch of druthers. It kind of goes kind of what Mark was just saying. Uh, he's telling law enforcement to thumb their nose at enforcement, and I don't think that's the appropriate level. You know, try to find the sweet spot between the city and the and the and the county, and uh, basically say, hey, we're going to do what we want to do in defiance of what the state has already put forward. So there will be more of a conversation on that going forward. I'm sure. My other question is about same-sex marriage. You know, uh, when it was passed in the Congress, uh, it's legal to have same-sex marriage. What do you think about that? Uh, is it legal? Is it nice to have a female marrying a female and uh, male marrying a male? It doesn't make sense to me. Right. Opinion, All right. Uh, well, you know, we live in a country that is a nation of laws, but we deserve the government that we elect. So if the people in their heart of hearts have an issue with any social issue, uh, on either side of the ball that they come down on it, pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-gay marriage, anti-gay marriage, however it is, those laws are created and generated by the people that they elect. So if they seriously have an issue with it, this is the blessing of America. You're not gonna get blacklisted by getting together with like-minded groups or people. Freedom of assembly is enshrined in the Constitution and exercising your political power to make sure that you hold accountable those people that you elect to do the voting, to do the legislation the way that you see fit. I would encourage anyone, uh, for whichever way that they see that particular issue, to really kick the tires and lift the hood on whoever it is that you're sending to D.C. and make sure that they're voting in accordance with your values and vision. Because if they're not, it's time to vote the bums out. Thank you for your input. Um, as a military man, let me just talk to you that way for a minute. All right now. Um, you understand that the division of assets and the need for communication. Absolutely. The Super Bowl. Cool. So in the Kansas legislature, and, and this applies specifically here in Cedric County, we have a great problem with mental health. I know you're aware of this. Mm -hmm. But we seem to scatter all our resources around in ways that they can't be marshaled against the one enemy that we all have. So do you have a vision or have you heard what the legislature, I know they've allocated some money and some of that, but it, it kind of is more than just a money issue. You know what? what the plan is for in the legislature for moving and it's not just a, a Cedric County issue but it's big here as well to deal with mental health in a way that kind of helps us with the jail problem and all the other problems that are generated by people who need mental health help and can't get it because of the resources that aren't available or whatever that is an excellent question and I want to appreciate you for, for asking it. However, I cannot answer it at this time uh, because I do not know what the uh, mode is that the leadership wants to go and pursue uh, and uh, any other... Uh, Can I have Yeah. <laughs> that might be a little longer, right? Uh, I, I can go research that by, by the 31st. Uh, but let me tell you this. 
we are very concerned with what we're seeing across as, as just citizens we're very concerned with what we're seeing across the nation on the rise of mental health issues and i don't even know if it's more mental health issues or if it's just getting more exposure now i don't know what the function actually is you know do we have more phones out here and are people reporting on it more has it always been at the same level or do we have an uptick i'm not sure but what you said is spot on it's not a money problem we can't just throw money after the issue and the other piece that you said is we have to galvanize and marshal together the forces in a strategic fashion with a, with a goal and, and, and milestones as a program manager that's one of the things we used to do we have that timeline and, and those and those milestones to say we are making these deliverables happen and this is the right trend uh, to attack the problem if we don't do something that does something and that's something that we really have to have a mind in the legislature always do something that does something right um, representative uh, Susan Humphreys brought in an individual uh, by the name of dr. Rick Lindsay uh, James Lindsay uh, forgive me James Lindsay who was a speaker on critical race theory and he read my bill and that was one of his comments that he made so I appreciate you bringing him in he said do something that does something this bill does something that stuck with me because that should be our clarion call be it with social issues or listening to people talking about mental health issues because it has an impact on our budget and the expenditure of funds that's the money piece but it also has an impact on the fabric of our society so that's something else that we really need to pay attention to and i would look forward to hearing from you um, and looking and, and if you have any suggestions that you see from other states that are doing things well let's get that into the pipeline and see if we can make a kansas solution because because what we handle at the at the state house are directives for the whole state, not necessarily Wichita. I'll leave that to Jim. How that is. All right, <laughs> sir. Uh, and, I, and I have to say an amen to your comments about the drug use. Uh, but my point is this: uh, acceptance and usage of drugs within the community appears to me to be directly related to crime as it impacts our neighborhoods. And crime, as it impacts our neighborhoods, brings everything down. I've been a landlord for going on 50 years now. Yeah. And I have seen how, as hard as I've worked to improve a, a, a block or a house or a neighborhood or anything that I am involved with, if somebody moves in to that block and and uh, then is the victim of crime, say, okay, their house gets broken into, uh, then they get discouraged on that neighborhood and they move out. But you, you're, so you lose a glimmer of hope. How can we get people in the legislature more aware of this drug, crime, degradation of our community lane? Because that is where it seems to happen. Okay. That's a great question. And how do you get your question is, how do you get us more aware of that link in that system, that self licking lollipop that continues to turn over and make those things happen? And it actually has far reaching effects in program management. We call that a wicked problem set. Right. Uh, so there are a lot of different facets to it. And just lopping off the one does not necessarily prohibit the other. One of the ways that you can get involved and, and let us know what's going on uh, from your perspective and your vantage point, uh, I would to give you two ways number one is come and talk to the committees uh, to the committee chairs find out uh, if there's model legislation but even if you don't have that if it's just an issue come and talk to the committee chairs uh, and, and their and their teammates and find out exactly what are they doing to pursue uh, a solution set for your issue but the other piece is actually come around and talk to the individual members as well the grassroots uh, that we know and love down here in, in the county uh, uh, back in the districts that is actually effective in Topeka as well you know the Bible talks about the woman with the issue of blood you know the Bible talks about with Solomon he's had the the the, uh, the woman who you know kept coming after the king and just bugging her and he's like why why won't she just leave me alone what does she want just hear her petition those types of instances, that persistence, that's the thing that works the most because you galvanize with that grassroots spirit and, and you do all those touches with those members so they actually see in the bubble 
that this is something that's huge. This is something that's that's growing. This is a wildfire that we cannot dismiss. So come up and make your presence known. Make the issue known. Engage. Uh, people aren't going to shy away from you. As a matter of fact, like I said before, it'll give them the spawn to actually stand up for you and what the issues are. And there's a lot that we don't know. I'm not a, a landowner, right? I'm not a, a, a landowner, but not a, a, a facility landlord. There we are. Uh, so I don't understand a lot of what you're seeing. I can I can envision a lot of the issues that are happening and how you know they multiply, uh, but I don't see it from your perspective. So I would appreciate you coming to tell me that, sir. Uh, my name is Joseph L. Moore. Yes, sir. And I am the chair of the Sedgwick County Black Republican. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> know me because uh, we've been active in the city, state for years. I would ask you, I'm here trying to uh, cover a couple of items that were questions that were asked that I may be able to go a little deeper into. If you ask this, if you ask this group how many of you knew about black Republicans, you find out that most of them did not realize they existed. We had, I mean, we had to show ourselves by saying black Republicans. And people understand that. People on TV, they see us, and they didn't realize they were black Republicans. So we had to put our name out there. And that's why we're out there. And we're trying to find uh, support from all of you. Our organization in here in Sedgwick County, it's almost half and half with black, white, Hispanic, a couple of Hispanics on uh, my council. The other thing I wanted to address is the question about uh, getting on the um, boards and stuff like that. If you, there's a list uh, that you can go online and find that have all of the uh, appointments and stuff on it, all of them. They tell you the date that the person that's currently on it uh, turns up. So if you want to apply, you know when you can apply. And you can, uh, you can get uh, someone to maybe check it out for you. But you can get that list. The uh, military, uh, all these other different, the uh, uh, forestry, all of that. Those people that are on there, the term coming up, and you can see the dates. You can apply. Then the, uh, the uh, chairs and stuff like that may have a lot to do with what they end up uh, doing as far as selection is concerned, but you can get your name on those lists. And thank you, and uh, we do like having your support. We meet at the uh, Range 54 every second Wednesday of the month. And you're welcome to come. Thanks for the job, Joseph. Brother. Hi, my name is Jerry Namatrovi. I'm openly white, so uh, if you want to make an appointment, I charge my usual fees for abuse. My points were two. I got about a thousand. One is I've watched Republicans for decades run around saying, oh, if we could only let blacks know how much we love them, then maybe we could get more of a black vote. Let's tell them how the civil rights vote went in 64, et cetera, et cetera. Let's support them in that if we know our veterans if we don't. Let's give them preference and so forth. Maybe then they'll love us and we'll get enough votes. It's never worked because there's no bottom to the well of racial fear and candor. And operating by the fear and candor is not good government. I'll discuss this county commission here in a couple weeks in this, in this matter. Uh, because we ignore the law. We have laws saying you can't discriminate. We have ignored it because the, uh, our rulers say, well, we won't have enough blacks you know, if we treat them equal, so we are going to get the In the past couple of years, they've openly said, oh, we're black, we're victims, we deserve preference. Any problems with that, White? Shut up. That's the way it's going to be. The second thing is, too, in the past couple of years, 
we have what I call two racial campaigns, open war against white people. People boast about how much they hate, particularly Caucasian, how much they have a double standard against their own race, and they want to discriminate, they want to believe up. There's too many white people for even shark weed now. And at the same time, we have what I call a campaign that we've gone from black preference, black entitlement, to almost black worship. If you see what's happened the last couple months, and TV, if you notice on TV, and, and I talk to the TV too much, oh, there's another commercial with blacks, and then the next commercial will be blacks, and maybe they'll have one with an interracial couple with it, and then another black. There's a war against white people, but we're trying to expunge them, and, and we're living in a dream world that if we only pander enough or do this and that, most people in this country, white and black and everybody, they don't want principles about liberty and opportunity. Some do, it's a good thing to do, but most of the people in this country want stuff. That's what you have to do to get the vote. Promise of stuff. Oh, free stuff, of course. But they're entitled to it. All right, that's my answer. Last question. I don't know about all that, but I do know as a, as a representative, uh, if, I, if I can encourage you to do one thing, turn off uh, Netflix, turn off uh, local news sometimes, turn off national news, turn on committee meetings, of the people you elected to go to office. You're, you can watch every committee meeting or listen to every committee meeting that happens in the House and a number of them at the, at the federal level. If you will watch, then you know what your representative is uh, You can choose the elected uh, officials for the next time around, or you can encourage them to just go. And, and don't listen to the... To the uh, 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 any services and, uh, and references. Look for facts, and you can do it because you're smart. I'm done. <coughs> okay. Uh, I know that he wants to make an announcement. May I close my comment? Close with a comment. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, we've got a couple of announcements. I'm and very patient. Election results. Proceed, <laughs> Representative. Everyone, you're my family. And I want to let you know how much I honor and respect you uh, just because of who you are. I've read the back of the book that we all say that we ascribe to. And I only see one man on that throne and his name is Jesus Christ. And when I see that man on that throne, the scripture is very plain and very clear what it says. It says that before that throne, he saw, John looked and he saw a sea as if it were glass and it was like a rainbow color. It was every nation, every kindred, and every tongue. Now me, I serve a God who sits high and looks low. I understand you have some angst. I've heard it. I understand that there's some people out there watching some of the wrong things and they're filling themselves with all of the things of the world. But that's not what we are called to do. We are called to be salt and light. Let me put it to you like this right here. We are all flowers in the garden of our God. It's the same thing that I told my little baby girl out in El Dorado when the, the bus came through traveling with all of our statewide candidates a few months back. And I said, how is it possible for the tulip to say to the rose, I hate you? And how is it possible for the geranium to say to the tulip, you're worthless? We are all here because we were in place here by God for his glory, for his enjoyment. So I don't have any beef or angst with you on basis of skin color. What I will tell you is this, and you've heard me say it before. I am a Christian first, so I identify with Christ. I am blessed to be black. I'm honored to have served in the military. And for some reason, unknown to me, probably because it helps me get along with so many people so well, I was honored to be in foster care and have white parents and black parents and Hispanic parents. So I understand a lot of how our society is fracturing, but let us not be that. Let us be the ones that bring people together, not divide on the things that the world tells us that, that these are our fault lines and that you can press here and break it all apart. Because I believe, as I've raised my hand for over 20 years to serve in this military, that there is something greater and bigger than myself, something greater and bigger than you and me, is greater and bigger than the sum of all of us. And that is the thing that I swore to uphold and defend, and I'm still doing that service today. So what I will tell you, sir, madam,
is if you ever have a question, you ever have a concern, you can come and talk to me about it. I'm not going to denigrate you, but I would ask that you please be respectful because there is a such thing as us coming together. And as uh, Mr. Hollis, as you said, part of that involves marketing. And one of the things for the marketing aspect of it is, is that you have to have that representation to have credibility with the people that you're trying to bring in. Now, maybe that message doesn't resonate with you, but it does with someone. And that helps us build power. That helps us build numbers. And I'm all aboard for building numbers, building power so that we can get done with conservatives, with Christians, what Republicans want to do here in Kansas and in America. With that, I want to thank you all so much for listening to me today. Bless you. Merry Christmas.